overflows, cognitive leap and child development. Cognitive leap is an important concept in the development of a child. A cognitive leap is time when child's brain is growing. When they first onset, it is scary for the child and they tend to be fussy, irritable or even misbehave. But after this period comes a new burst in ability. They become calm again and or not just a joy to be around, but totally fascinating. This is when parents take more pictures of them and share them on social media. Leaps are age related and predictable. They are also frequent. There are hundreds of them over a person's lifetime. I like to use a metaphor that it is as if children like are like caterpillars who go into hiding for a bit while everything gets rearranged. And when they come out on the other side as a butterfly, but they do it over and over and over again. When you are rearranging the house or the facilities like a caterpillar, they go in hiding. And when things are rearranged, they come out from the other side like butterfly, rejoicing and jumping, overjoyed. Cognitive leap is efficient, objective and fun assessment tool as well as, as, well as engaging treatment system that brings that bring children's families and clinicals together to support lasting functional improvements in the children. This cognitive leap that children make helps them understand that other people are an important source of information. Harris says they understand that they need other people to make sense of the world. Once, they, once that leap is made, they then realize it is worth asking questions. Of course, have been controversial when it comes to learning. Interesting what you are told. Harris tells a story about developmental psychologist Jean Piggott's response to his to his daughter, who after toiling around and around and feeling dizzy, asked her father if the world was turning around. Two. What do you think? Piggott replied. His da daughter, frustrated, shouted back, You always ask me that. This is the situation. When children ask the question, the parents in turn ask them the counter question, What do you think about that? Piggott clearly wanted his daughter to figure it out for herself. He feared, as others often do, that when children ask questions, they will unthinkably defer to adult authority, Harris writes. They will not check or test the answers they receive. However, this strikes Harris as simplest, simplest. If a young child is puzzled about why it gets dark at night, he says it is not as if they are going to start figure out, figuring out the rotation of the earth. 
Plus, as Harris discovered, children don't blindly defer to adults. Often they think about what they have been told and then ask more questions based upon that. This is specifically true when in response to an original question, children are given an adequate explanation such as birds can fly because they have wings. When the child asks how birds can stay in the air as opposed to a vague answer like I don't know. Harris found that trust is not automatic for children or for that matter in any person. When people ask me questions and I do not satiate them, the trust does not develop in them and trust is one of the most important way for transformation or growth. He says trust is not automatic for children. They not only monitor the messenger starting when they are babies, but as they get older, they also often question the contents. This is what I have observed. Many inquisitive seekers ask questions. When they are given a proper explanation, their trust grows leaps and bounds and also it helps them in the process of transformation. In several experiments, teachers gave three to five year old information about an unfamiliar object from a hardware store. Both teachers, one well known to the students and the other not known well, made up names and information about the objects. All age groups equally showed a strong preference for the answer given by the familiar teacher. This is what I have realized in my long experience of dealing with all kinds of seekers. If any time I give them an explanation, they trust and it satiates them because the explanation is coupled with examples that they can relate. Their trust grows and that time if I ask them that go and read this a little more. So they do that. So in that case, Harris observed that the information was that was given by the teacher that was known to them was they had a strong preference. This type of early selectivity is all but universal among children growing up under normal rearing conditions. So children lean on their parents for all sort of information and it is the responsibility of the parents like the responsibility of the master to give them proper explanation. Harris writes, this early profiling of people, reliable, not reliable, means that caregivers often offer much more than a, a secure base for autonomous exploration. exploration. Harris writes, what they say about the world may or may not be internalized and become part of the child's conception of the way things are. What happens when person providing the information is harder to gauge? Kathleen Corriveau, an assistant professor 
at Boston University School of Education, worked with Harris for several studies, including one that looked at this situation. She says, we found that under these circumstances, three and four years old look to other people's reaction for guidance. She says, they are more likely to accept an informant's claim if it is endorsed by other people. Even when those other people leave as children, she says they are more likely to accept the informant's claim if it is endorsed by other people, even when those people leave. As children got older, researchers found that the track record of the person providing the information started to take on more importance. The more often they were accurate, the more they were trusted. So if whatever information you are providing to the children or as a master to the seeker that creates if it is accurate, it creates more trust. When using stories to figure out how children differentiate real from fiction, real from fiction, Harris found that by the age of five or six, children believe the protagonist of a story is believe the protagonist of a story is not real if the story includes magic or fantasy. Despite actor Daniel Radcliffe being human, most children understand that the character Harry Potter isn't. It is the story. It is if If a story does not contain magical or fan fantastical elements, however, children generally have to trouble believing a protagonist is real. This naturally helps children sort out information about people they have never met. With this way, they can sort out the information about the children, about the persons they have never met. How you relate the information to the children, how then to explain religious stories which often include things that do not, uh, don't ever happen in real life, such as the parting of the sea. Harris assumed that children's magic detector would go <coughs> off, indicating that this kind of event could not really happen. Instead, he found that children are often willing to accept the miracles or the extraordinary powers of God, perhaps because religious stories are often presented as real always.